Hi, and welcome to another episode of World Beyond Belief. This is a special episode because we have our friend, Oli Damagard, back, and he's got a story for you. Uh, he was in Norway. He was investigating, you know, he shines light on conspiracies, and he found a woo, uh, doozy. He found a, uh, an incident where people were actually killed. He's detailed how the uh, powers that be thwarted any type of rescue. And um, there's a political motivation to keep Norway in the EU. And also, we believe that there was a ritual uh, going on at the same time by the Freemasons and the Bilderbergs. So this is sit back, relax. Uh, for those of you who aren't European, you have to pay, pay attention because um, we're talking about kind of a land that you've, you've never thought about. But this is Norway. Um, it's a wonderful, beautiful country. And uh, it's fighting the same way we are to try to be free and try to be peaceful. So let's move on to this interview with Oli Damagard. I'm sure you'll like it. And then I'll be back after. So many are, are being used, you know, for yeah. different reasons, and they're not aware of it. And it's just amazing. Uh, and then uh, I, I would, I'm just come back from Norway. Uh, I went there at the anniversary of the mass shooting, and uh, I went both to where the bomb exploded uh, at the government building, but also to, to this island where all of these youngsters were slaughtered. And uh, I was. Uh, told to leave or I would be arrested. So that was a bit of an experience as well. Wow. <laughs> well, let me do your introduction and then we can continue with this conversation. Today's, yeah. a, very, today's a very special world beyond belief. We have our old friend back again, Holy Damagard. Uh, he's been inspiring us for many years now and uh, teaching us about how these, these New World Order blankety blanks have manipulating our morality and manipulating uh, people in politics for a long time. He just came back from a trip to Scandinavia uh, where he's been uh, investigating another mass shooting. So welcome, Oli. Why don't you continue what you were saying? Because I'm going to leave that first part on. Okay. Go ahead. Well, thank you. Thank you so much for having me back on the show again. No, uh, I've just come back from a tour in Norway and Sweden. <clears throat> I was uh, I was so fortunate after uh, my talk at the Open Mind Conference in Amsterdam that the uh, organizer, he said, uh, listen, we really need to keep the ball rolling. Is there anything I can help you with? And I said, please get me to Norway. It's the anniversary of the mass shooting. If you can get me there, I will do everything I can on site and location to learn as much as all and also spread as much as possible so he gave me a ticket which was absolutely amazing wow. and then i went there for i was saying it was about nine days but the synchronicity was just divine it was incredible the amount of things that happened during these nine days was just absolutely mind-blowing which also once again gives me great hope that something is guiding us, something is protecting us, something is helping us, because I couldn't even make up a, a wish list for all the things that happened during these nine days, if I, uh, because many of the people, I didn't even know they existed. I even had a pillow talk with uh, the author in Norway, the only one, as far as I know, that had the uh, uh, written books about the, the New World Order, the Bilderberg Group, the Trilateral Commission, and so on. I, spent, I, I shared bed with him without knowing wow. he's 84. Uh, uh -huh. We woke up in the same guest room after a party and had a pillow talk at 6 o'clock in the morning. And How wonderful. I, just found out, I, did, I didn't even know he existed, this guy, and he would be like the top one, two, three on my absolute wish list for Norway. And then I ended up sharing bed with him. So that, things like that just kept happening all the time. So uh, it, was, uh, it was absolutely amazing. But uh, no, the thing is, uh, 
I, I believe it's so important to keep exposing these false flag operations, these uh, black ops and, and so on, because they're being used in so many different areas of life against so many of us. And uh, no, it, it's just incredible because I know my, uh, the, the lecture I gave uh, at the Open Mind Conference in Copenhagen uh, 2014, it's, uh, it has like 25,000 views or something like that. And it, when I was in Sweden, I was met up by Hells Angels, and it turns out that they have been watching it as well, because they are the victim of many false flag operations, according to themselves. They are being blamed and set up for a lot of, of these things that they have not, absolutely nothing to do with. And even the many of the gang wars uh, uh, between these so-called motorbike gangs, uh, they're being set up. That's what they told me. You know, there there is a big uh, thing, in, I think, in the U.S. now where, uh, I don't know the name of these biker gangs, they were, uh, there was a, a meeting arranged because there was a conflict going on, and I think nine people were killed and it turned out that all of them were shot by snipers uh, that had nothing to do with the with the biker gangs. And then this was pumped out as a as a gang war and, and so on. I remember so, that. I remember that happening. Everybody thought so they this, were just crazies. Go ahead. Yeah, well, what else is new? Crazy yeah. people once again that shoot each other. I mean, it, this is the thing you hear again and again. And so I go out there and... I, I, I just feel totally blessed because I go to meet friends in uniforms, in gangs, in Hells Angels, in the elite, whatever, and I meet all these people, beautiful people, all of them, very confused, some of them with a lot of karma to pay back on because some of them have not been nice uh, to other people, but now they're waking up to what's going on and really trying to redeem themselves and uh, also because they've been duped uh, mm -hmm. as so many others. And recently I, I was even contacted by people in the Stay Behind movement in, in Sweden. I mean, these are the people I have tried to expose for so many years, at least some of the elements in these groups. And now it turns out that many of them are well-meaning totally duped uh, individuals who thought they were doing the right thing and now find out that, oh my God, what have we been involved in? We've, we've been part of creating a monster without knowing it. And this monster has been used for terrorizing populations and killing people and so on. So, so they're in the awakening process of saying, oh, we've, wow, we had no idea, right. no idea. So also, I've, I've had emails from, from um, uh, kids in, uh, you know, immigrant kids and Muslim groups and so on in Sweden also, who, have said, who are watching my talks about the false flag saying, we are also being used. You know, there were big riot, there were riots in Sweden and so on. They said, we were blamed for it. We, had not, we weren't even there. But everybody thinks, no, you are the ones, you know, because we read the papers, we keep reading about the, these, uh, you know, immigrants and, and foreigners and so on, and criminal gangs and so on. And I meet up with them and they're very confusing. It, it was not us, we didn't do it, but we're being blamed for it. And now we're sort of the, so, so many people are being uh, played. So I would say, Go time to wake up and see what's going on, and then let's just stop the madness. Right. So, I would very much like today to uh, enlighten you or share some light on a very, very awful incident that happened almost exactly four years ago. It is the massacre on the 22nd of July, 2011, in Norway. This is uh, an incident that I, as far as I know, very few people have looked into with a critical eye. And at the same time, it is the biggest massacre after the Second World War done by a lone crazy guy, as far as I know. So uh, uh, if it's okay with you, I would like to give you the official story first and then uh, 
my version based on the findings of an incredible Norwegian journalist called Hans Gorder. Uh, there's another one called Jostemek. He's, uh, he's anonymous. But these two, I think, are the only ones that really have dug into this uh, with a critical eye. Mm -hmm. And then I have spent a lot of time also looking into the evidence. And it's sort of like, here we go again. again. Jeez. Here we go again. And uh, I'll give you the official story first. The official story is that there was a lone crazy guy. Sounds surprising, but a lone <laughs> crazy guy, an extremist. His name was Anders Bevin Brady, a Norwegian born. And uh, he, for some reason, was very upset. Uh, he was against uh, multi uh, culture and uh, anti Muslim. He was an anti Muslim. And he thought that uh, this is the official story. He so thought that the Labour Party of Norway had betrayed the country. So he thought, let's teach them a lesson. Let's go and kill as many as I can. That's the idea. So what he did was, inspired by the Oklahoma City bomb, he, he did an almost identical hit on the government building, uh, like in Oklahoma City. He made a fertilizer bomb, he put it in a van, a rental van. He drove and parked it right outside the government building in central Oslo. He left it there, he was dressed in a police uniform with a helmet, with a, everything on, so you cannot recognize him there when he leaves the vehicle. And then he, he leaves it, go, gets a, a rental car and drives off. The bomb then explodes and, and just blows the whole center of Oslo. It, I mean, it's totally blown out. He then, uh, while he's on his way north, he goes about 40 minutes uh, northwest of Oslo, uh, out in a beautiful area uh, the, in the countryside. There's a big lake and fjords, and there's an island out there, heart-shaped island called Tiltøya, uh, where there's a summer camp for the youth of the uh, Norwegian uh, Labour Party. And so the official story says that he, he, uh, he goes on board, there's a small little ferry, uh, that can only take like one vehicle and about 50 people in total without the vehicle. And he, he, he gets on board on that, he crosses, and he's dressed like a police uh, officer, and he's got a very heavy bag that people help him carry ashore. Then as soon as he gets over there, he pulls out these guns, starts walking around very calmly, and then suddenly starts killing people. And in total, he slaughters officially 86 uh, youngsters, most of them between the age of 14 and 17. Then he's uh, arrested by the SWAT team that comes to the island and uh, he's now tried as the lone crazy assassin for this whole thing, or he's sentenced and in prison for it. But here comes a major but. I'm not talking about my own. No, it's but, a major, uh, but no, I know this was that was the official story. That's what all it was in all the newspapers and TV, yeah. and that puts it to bed. Okay, yeah, but that's it. And, and this is the official story to this very day. I would just like to add maybe a question mark or thirty in uh, just right. around this whole thing, and then I start showing things, and then everybody can make up their own mind. Okay? Cool, cool. Sounds fair enough? Sounds great. So, there was a beautiful man called Fletcher Prouty. He used to work for the Pentagon and the CIA. Uh, he is the guy that is portrayed by Donald Sutherland in the film JFK. Uh, he's the one that is called Mr. X, explaining exactly what these black ops do and the background around the JFK assassination in the film. This man, Fletcher Prout, he became a whistleblower and he spent the rest of his life exposing these operations. And one of the things he said was, a sure sign of a black op is not what happens, but what does not happen. You know? Interesting. So don't, Interesting. don't focus on what happened. Look at what doesn't happen. For some strange reason, suddenly things stop working. Cameras are not working, everything is delayed, uh, bodyguards are told to stand down, 
uh, any type of security said, uh, don't worry, we'll take over here, but no security uh, takes over, and so on. So what does not happen? So I would like just to point out a few or many things that did not work this day. And please keep in mind that Norway had put a major focus on anti-terror uh, security during the, the years before. Also one thing that keeps repeating itself when it comes to these are so-called drills. The drill in a false flag operation you know, a blackout, I would suggest, is there to get vehicles in position, explosives in position, people, extras, uh, makeup, whatever is needed in position without normal people interfering. That is why the drill is there. And here, just by coincidence, in central Oslo, there was a major deal going on in the exact same area as the government building that ended like <clears throat> 22 minutes before the actual thing happened. What a coincidence. Anyway, so you look, let's, let's look at the, the, the site itself. It is so weird. I, I was guided there by the, my new friend, this journalist, Hans Gordon. And the whole area, even though it's four years ago, is still standing there, totally empty, totally blown out, like a monument of death and destruction. It is very odd, to say the least. You look at the damages, you take a fertilizer bomb, the science that could go into a van, no way can you make that kind of damage. Absolutely no way. And also, you have, when you have an explosion, you always have an epicenter where the explosives are and everything right. is blown out in a circular motion in all different directions. That can be stopped by walls or ceilings or whatever is in the way. And then you will see the damages change, whatever has been stopping the blast. Here, instead of the major impact being where the van is said to have been, the most impact is at the top of the building and all windows. There's not one single window in the whole block that is still there. Everything was blown up, but not blown out, blown in. When you see on the surveillance cameras and also the shop windows in central Oslo, and all the glass is sucked out into the street instead of blown into the shops. It was sucked in. It was a, and where the, where the vehicle is said to have been, instead of a blast going outwards, the, the ceiling uh, uh, or the roof that was above it, a concrete roof, that looks like melted cheese. There's one corner that is just hanging down like this. And then the whole area is filled with debris, but nothing sort of blown away from where the van was, was standing. It is just debris everywhere. And when you see the first images, there's absolutely no people there. Very, very few. Just smoke and, and a few people are running around. The, it seems like the, the streets were blocked off. Surprise, surprise. Surprise, surprise. It seems like the, the buildings were evacuated. Surprise, surprise. And this was also Friday afternoon. Surprise, surprise. If you remember when we talked about other false flag operations that they really like to do them on Friday afternoons because then there's room for a lot of insider trading building up to this thing. Then when the blast goes off or the kill is done, then all oh, out of uh, respect for the morning uh, families, we close the stock market. And then they have Friday afternoon, Saturday, Sunday, sort everything out, lock all the currencies, and then we just make a bundle before we open up Monday morning. Or we keep it closed one more day because we so feel for the morning families. That is the whole idea. They also have time with the propaganda to get their story straight before the uh, Sunday, Monday paper. They have all this time where nobody's paying attention. Yeah. That, that is an, yeah. But uh, nowadays, the papers, online papers, are so quick. So I think that was more in the old days. Right. But very good point. Very good point. But uh, uh, anyway, so uh, when question marks were put 
like where why is there no sort of like uh, mark in the in the street or where the car was why don't you why is there no why can't you see where the explosion took place suddenly a crater like six uh, eight feet wide crater opened up uh, in in the but, but in, in the, the wrong location. location it's not really where the band was standing and i would say on some photos you will see there's a fire brigade uh, one of these big ones with a, a ladder that is parked right above where this hole appeared and i would suggest maybe it was parked there while this hole was made underneath it yeah. because also they it has the ladder going up horizontal right into a building I, I, I mean i don't get it it's like but also you see uh the the fire brigade the uh, fire station is right it's only like a hundred meters from where the blast was but unfortunately all the the, uh, the car ports were locked because of the the blast so no fire uh, fire wagons could come out also no ambulances could arrive to the area because they said there was so much debris that nobody could enter the area but when you look at the photos there's there's paper some wood i mean nothing heavy nothing that a four-wheel drive couldn't easily pass but all these uh, ambulances are directed in the wrong spot so they they stand in a long long line in a in a different area of of central uh, oslo uh, so instead the victims that appear after a little while because you you cannot see any victims to start with, but then suddenly they they're there, and they're there, you know, blood and and some people come with the whole face is covered with blood, nothing in their hair, but the you know, and also there's um, there's one woman that comes up with the big uh, like a wooden stick that sticks right out of Whoa. her head like this, yeah. But I tell you, when you look at these, uh, I really feel that this this thing we are into uh i think as a staged event with with these extras they come out from nowhere and uh i i really want to say i want no disrespect if somebody actually got hurt there but really i i need to put a big question mark because people just appear with bandages people appear with that with um, damages that looks very odd and then instead of getting an ambulance there because the ambulances never arrive there's no photos with ambulances or fire stay uh, or fire wagons uh, until very late uh, instead it said that they stop a local bus uh, and and empty it for passengers and then use the bus to get all of these people with these uh, uh, wounds uh, all of them in this bus and then drive them to the hospital. I would say that's a very good way of getting people out of the way without normal people being able to see that it was not really the real thing. Getting them to hospital where they could be put on with all the bandages and all of these things. Sounds more like what uh, you'd use to get actors to a, mm -hmm. uh, a set location and then get actors away from a set location. Sounds like you'd use a bus, I, not an ambulance. What do you think about I that? I totally agree. Yeah. I totally agree. And then the when you see the fire brigade, uh, there's photos from the fire brigade. The photos of them are more or less all of them is from behind and with blurred faces. You cannot see the people, the, uh, the firefighters. And this, I would say once again, in these operations, as soon as people have uniforms on, you don't notice them. You just take it for granted that they are who they are supposed to be. I would very much suggest, once again, just because somebody has a police uniform on or a fire brigade, a firefighter uniform or something like that, you need to put a question mark there. And on all of these photos, it, they are taken so that you see people from behind, 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 whatever angle, most of them are from behind. And then there's, just after the blast, there's a woman in, uh, she comes out in a short uh, sleeve uh, shirt in a uniform type looking, official, officially looking with a name tag around her and a walkie talkie. And she tells the first photographer, back up, back up, back up. This uniform has never, it's, it's not an official uniform. It's like a mix between a, 
uh, the one they have in the office at the fire station and a police uniform. There's no emblem, there's no nothing. And this woman has never been identified. Then just around the corner, exactly uh, minutes after the blast, uh, there are two white vans that are parked, one of them is parked illegally uh, on right outside the high court in Oslo. And out of there, there's three or five, I'm not sure how many there are, uh, uniformed MP soldiers, like Red Beret, uh, and they're running around and they're telling the first TV team that arrives, back off, back off. And while the TV team is backing off, they keep, still keep filming and they see these soldiers, they, they've got uh, blue plastic gloves on, and they're pulling up a white cable from the street level, a long, long white cable. Whatever cable that is, I do not know. These three soldiers are later seen taking care of the wounded uh, also. And uh, when questioned who they were, uh, there was an article in the newspaper saying, here we are, and the three people in the article are not the same as the one you see on the film sequence or the photos. And on the photos, very few of them show them their faces. I managed to get some so I can identify, at, at least I can say it's not the same as in the article. And yes, it's the same as the one that are pulling out this white cable. <clears throat> also, some of the people that are rescuing these victims have the same kind of blue plastic gloves on, or rubber gloves. I don't, I don't know why they have that. Anyway, so, but that was, that was it. Um, the, the explosion uh, was about uh, 3.30 in the afternoon. And uh, I would suggest when you look at the damages that we're not talking about normal explosives because also the few surveillance cameras that was working because just as usual, uh, very few cameras uh, we are allowed to see uh, uh, what actually happened. But there's some cameras where the films have been uh, released and there you can see that there's an explosion in one end of the building and then it, it, it sort of travels through the building like in a wave form, and the explosion is on the wrong side of the building, not where the van is supposed to have been, but on the other side. So major, major question marks around this whole event. Uh, anyway, uh, when um, that was chapter one, then chapter two is the thing on the island. And the whole thing is that uh, the shooting, I think, started like uh, five, 25, something like that, about two, uh, from, from 3.30 to 5.30 more or less, that time in interference. So the whole uh, central uh, Oslo was, uh, people were coming there, but on the photos you see very little people there, very, very few people. And the firefighters, there's one place that is on fire, uh, up a corner, uh, a department, the oil department, where there's a fire. But instead, the firefighters, instead of trying to, to turn up the fire, they have, they're focused on moving a car on, on the street from one pavement to the other. And it's not even in the way. There's no other vehicles that needs to go anywhere or anything like that. They're just doing it to do something. You know, to, it all looks very efficient. It all looks very dramatic. It, but when you look at it, it's like, Nothing Why? is happening. And I'm, I'm in the middle of, of really, uh, in great detail, point, uh, you know, pinpointing where the different people were and then see how they move around, how the vehicles are moved from one pavement to the other, uh, where, the car, where the streets were closed off and so on and so on. Maybe in a few weeks we can make a follow-up thing and then I can talk more about what I've come up with. Great. But, but uh, let's move to the island, because here is where the real tragedy starts. Because I, I think that if anyone was killed in Oslo, uh, it is possible, because, I mean, with that blast and all the glass and all of these things, they, the official uh, number is eight killed in Oslo. But I, I really want to put a big question mark around that. Also, because when... There's one man that is running around with a camera or a mobile, 
and he's, he enters into the government building and runs around and the whole thing, the whole building is blown up, uh, but not like with an explosive, just the whole facade is blown up. And he, he keeps running around, uh, shouting, calling out, anyone here, anyone here, anyone here, there's no one there, absolute no one there. It's totally evacuated. Anyway, so uh, if we go to the island, the shooting starts around, I think it was 5.25 in the afternoon. And uh, it's from the mainland, it's 600 meters. It's take, if you take a, a, a power boat, you can be there in less than a minute. I mean, it's just straight just across, across boom, that's yeah. it. Straight across, full view, and so on. But instead of people, of police and army and all of these things reacting, everything goes into absolute slow down, standstill, nothing happens. Abs so this gunman that is said that there are witnesses talking from one gunman up to five people in police uniforms that are walking around with very powerful rifles and guns and just slaughtering these youngsters. They're running all over the place trying to hide and they just walk around and execute them one by one by one by one. Some, some of the youngsters try to swim ashore. They're killed in the water. Some of them drown uh, and so on. It, it is horrendous. And this is allowed to go on for more than an hour. More than one hour. So now I'm going to tell you a bit about the things that did not work this day. Unfortunately, even though they spent so many much money and training and so on on the special special op uh, Delta groups and so on, you know that are so highly trained and and all this equipment and so on. Can I ask a so, quick question? Please do. Let me ask a quick question. He took a boat to the island. And we got yeah. off when he got off the island, or when he got off the boat onto the island. You said people helped him get all of his arms onto the island. Who were these people? Yeah. Were these the other shooters? It, it, very good point, but it's said to be normal people that were just going to the island because there was this summer camp. There was about five hundred uh, youngsters there on the island, and uh, they didn't know that there were weapons in it. Uh, they just and they, they just uh, given testimony about that they, it was a very heavy bag that he was carrying, yeah, and he had like a, uh, like a um, wetsuit type of police uniform on. They say, they say. Anyway, but uh, I would say uh, five hundred people are being shot at. All of them, more or less, had mobile phones, so. Uh, it wouldn't be a problem really to get through to the police. But unfortunately, uh, the police alarm PCs had been turned off. Of course. So, and also, very unfortunate, the internet didn't work at the police stations that was involved. Also, when people were calling in, there was a, a, a problem with a, a relay uh, in the communication central. So the calls were diverted to the wrong police district. Then, unfortunately, I'm going to repeat the word unfortunately. Unfortunately, the police helico the helicopter team were given extra summer holiday. So uh, they were given four uh, weeks extra to save money. Okay, So they were spread all over the country. I just want to point out that the year before, uh, they had not, the same uh, organization had not used $22 million in funds uh, for, that they could have used. So it's a little bit odd that they're doing all of these savings, I would say. Mm -hmm. That's 227 million Norwegian kroner. Okay. Then, uh, unfortunately, there was only four police officers on duty in central Oslo, that is four, maybe five, and two of them were unfortunately stationed outside the U.S. Embassy and the Israeli Embassy. Go figure. Go figure. 
And then, unfortunately, uh, the police did not have the the bulletproof vest or weapons or anything like that because a few weeks earlier they had been asked to give them in, you know, to the station because they if they weren't using them on a daily basis they were asked to to give them in, and they were locked in. And the system said that two officers had to be there at the same time to open uh, these uh, uh, where wherever the equipment was, so they couldn't get to the equipment. Okay. Unfortunately, there was a specially trained terror unit that did not get alerted uh, after this uh, thing because uh, they were using a different uh, uh, type of uh, uh, communication system, and a new updated communication system, but the other units were not. So in the end, they had to use fax to communicate with each other. Oh, man. Fax and mobile phones, the normal net was just knocked out, okay? So, uh, unfortunately, it took 77 minutes before there was a national alert uh, sent out. Um, before that, nothing happened. The rest of Norway was not aware of it, okay? Then you have all of the kids calling 911, or it's 112 in Norway, right. saying, calling in saying, my God, we're being shot at, they're killing us, come and help us. The, the people in the police or whoever answered the calls said, uh, sorry, we do not believe you, call your parents and get them to call us. Okay. So the kids, while being shot at, I mean, please consider, people are being killed every single minute, okay? So they call their parents and the parents try to call the police and then, because it said that there's only two uh, lines into this uh, uh, emergency unit, it's blocked down. So they can't get through. They cannot get through. And when they finally get through, they're met by police that are really, they don't really seem to care. They say, we're so focused on this thing in Oslo, very sorry about you being shown at, but uh, we can't handle more than one thing. So thank you and goodbye. Please try again a bit later. Okay, so the local police, when they heard about this, they said, oh my God, we need to get going now. But unfortunately, their special unit car, was uh, the, the battery was flat. So uh, they needed to go and get the jumper cables. Why are you laughing? Well, you know what the Keystone I'm, Cops... I'm sick. I know I'm you're serious. serious here, you know? what? Do, you, do you remember the Keystone Cops? Are you aware of what the Keystone Cops were in the... That's what this sounds like. It sounds like everything. Yeah, it's no, amazing. It's amazing. I think, I think this is Monty Python. It is Monty you know, Python. Really? Okay. So the helicopter team uh, in in the police. I mean, as soon as they heard about this, they came in and said, "We're here. We're here." But unfortunately, uh, the helicopter, at least one of them, had just been repainted. So the, the, the different, there was a lot of technical equipment that needed to be uh, assembled first be before they could start off. And then, unfortunately, when they had this whole team of sharpshooters ready within another helicopter, there was another helicopter, as far as I've been able to find out, they, they were not tanked. There was no gas in the tank. What a bummer. But then, when they finally were ready to take off, they were given a direct order to stand down. Stand down. Who gave that order? Who gave that order? Anyway, so uh, then uh, the first police. Yeah, I need to say also that when the shooting started, the first one that was shot was. I don't know if this is coincidence, but it's the stepbrother of the Norwegian princess. He was the security guard there. He was the first one that was killed, uh, executed, uh, together with the, the woman that had been in charge of the island for, for many years. Uh, but th this ferry, this small little ferry called MS Turbion, it's, it used to be in the, in the Navy, and it was an armored uh, vessel, you know, so perfect to do a rescue uh, right. operation here. But as soon as the sh as soon as the shooting started, the the leader of the youth party, Eskil Pedersen, he and, and uh, eight other people ran 
and jumped on board on the ferry and escaped without trying to help anyone. They escaped on this uh, ferry and instead of going straight across to the ferry and leave the ferry there so that the police could get on it and uh, it could be used to in a right. uh, rescue action, they went north. They went almost, like almost nine kilometers north to a different place and rammed it up on shore so that it could not be used. Wow. So suddenly they cut the lifeline between the mainland and the island by doing that. Okay, so the first police that came to uh, this place, of course they tried to get straight to the island. No, they were told that uh, uh, please just stand back and wait. Just wait and, you, and give us an update of what is happening. So they were standing on the other side just looking. Okay, so uh, then uh, well, while people were calling in and so on, uh, totally terrified, uh, the police told them, don't worry, police and ambulances, everybody, everything is coming, both in cars, uh, boats and helicopters. No one came. No one came until after the, the assassin had been arrested. Okay, so when the police came, uh, instead of trying to get across, they went to a camping site near, nearby. Did they try to get hold of a boat there? Answer is no. So they, uh, they said, well, I'm sorry, but uh, well, we couldn't really find a boat there. There was, a, as far as I've been finding, uh, able to find out, there was about 20 small boats there, but they did not. Okay, so there was another police district nearby. They had a, a patrol that was available and said, please, please, we're here. No, sorry, stand down. Then uh, another patrol from a, a city called Drammen, they were told just bypass the island drive by it and go north to another island for some uh, 10 kilometers further north and stand by there. Let's meet up there. Okay, so we have... Um, then the special ops came in. I mean, here are the heavy guards, the guys, you know, that we spend millions and millions training. These are super trained, the black ops SWAT teams, these type of guys. There, as far as I know, there were five Delta teams this day in this operation. So they came full speed ahead, you know, now let's get and go there, get the bad guy, and uh -huh. so on. Unfortunately, they bypassed the, the ferry site. They didn't know where it was, so they managed to drive by it without seeing where it was. They continued out to the camping site I just mentioned, Utvika, and they went down there. Unfortunately, they turned around and left before they noticed that there was like a lot of uh, private boats in the border, like a hundred meters from where they turned around. Then they, uh, uh, they drove off in their special vehicles and of course, uh, as soon as they got hold of a vessel, it was a rubber boat, they put it in as close to the island as they could. Ah, wrong again. Instead of 670 meters to, across to the island, they went 8.6 kilometers further north. Eight points. In the, in the meantime, please remember, young, beautiful people are being slaughtered by the minute. Okay? So they went 8.6 kilometers. That is a long way further north where they put in uh, the rubber boat in and started going towards the wrong island, even though they could hear the shooting from that, you know. So they went towards the wrong island, but unfortunately, there were 10 people in one small rubber boat, and they had all this heavy equipment. So the, I mean, it's Monty Python here. It's, you can find it on YouTube. Nice. They're standing up, they're standing up in all the black armor and all of it, and they're so heavy, so the rubber boat starts taking in water. So the water goes into the engine and the engine dies. So they're floating around with their high-tech uh, SWAT team equipment. So a private boat has to come and rescue them and say, what are you, what are you doing? What are you doing? doing yeah. And so, so they say, Cole, please, can we take your boat instead? So they swap boats with this uh, guy and then they take off towards the island. In the meantime, people are dying. Are dying. Okay. So 
also uh, the police helicopters. I think there was 11 helicopters in total. Um, yeah, uh, there was 11 helicopters in total that was used this day. All of it right after the the assassin was uh, was arrested. Before that, none, none, an absolute none. Instead, there were two black helicopters circling the island, unidentified. I mean, if you have not heard about black ops before, this is one this of the ingredients. It. Yeah. Anyway, so, but the, the helicopter group for, for defense, they had been warned about a terror act 40 minutes before it actually happened. And still Always. were told to stand down. Yeah. Okay, so... Um, well, 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 I'm getting. Let me ask. Let me ask Anything questions. To... This has got me. This has got me intrigued. Were there really? Were there really kids confirmed dead? There were really dead people in this. Do we know? Well, well, this. This is. Uh, I. This is such a, a bizarre question to ask, and I need to ask it as well. When you look at Sandy Hook and other places, oh, yeah. like that, were there? But but I really do believe that the, that people were murdered here because there's so uh, there's so many uh, from the outside you know the tourists and people in private boats and so on that came on board and and so many around this that it would be very hard to to co coordinate. But I I really believe that these people died. Unfortunately, okay. I wish they didn't. But anyway, so go ahead. When, when the ambulance came, the, there was a whole long line of ambulances. The police pushed them away so they could not get down to, to try and take care of the, the, the ones that had swum across, you know, and the people that had been rescued by private boats and so on. And uh, while this Anders Breivik was walking around, I mean, people heard shooting from different uh, locations on the island. Uh, they were talking about two, maybe three shooters, and the daughter of a police chief that was on the island, she was there, co was calling to her dad saying, there are, five, there are five people in police uniforms killing us, and they have also hang, hung explosives in the trees around here. Oh there was one smoke bomb or some kind of bomb that went out with a big white, uh, yellow uh, smoke cloud uh, and so on. But this... And, and also the, the special unit the team, when they came, when they gave interviews afterwards, they were talking about that they arrested one of the assassins. But the official story is only one. The other ones have just disappeared. Anyway, but while he was walking around shooting, uh, this Anders Breivik, while he was shooting, he was in direct communication with the police center, the alarm center, on his mobile, saying, this is Commander Breivik, uh, operation uh, completed, ready to surrender to Delta Team. Operation they, completed? They then, yeah, they, they then say, uh, when he says that, the, the other one, uh, whoever answered that phone call, he's one of the top guys, he said, okay. I mean, that is the normal way you would uh, answer a question like that. He said, so what mobile are you calling from? Is it your mobile? And, he, and then Breivik says, no, it's not mine. And then it's the, the connection is cut, they say officially. Then, unfortunately, they, they couldn't uh, give this number to the SWAT teams or anything else because it was only afterwards, uh, as far as I know, that this came up that he had actually called. And then they said, we, we didn't know where to call back to because there was no number displayed. And it seemed like uh, he was calling without a SIM card. Okay. But as far as I know, he called twice. And how did he know about Delta teams? How did he know about these things? Anyway, so, uh, well, they didn't call him back. That's for sure. And then when, when they arrested him, when the Delta team finally arrived to the island, they, they uh, ran across and they were, they were, I don't really know what they were doing for quite a while because they were hiding behind the van. And then when they approached him, 
Was there a big shootout? Was there a big... No, nothing like that. As far as I've been informed, they called out his name and he just put his, his gun down right away and put his arms out like this. Jeez. And then he surrendered. But the official uh, time for when he was arrested, it, the, the time that the police said they arrested him, the shooting kept on for about five to seven minutes more, suggesting once again that there was more than one shooter. And when the, the military helicopters later uh, landed on the island, it is said that they uh, transported out at least one sharpshooter from the island. I would suggest who did they transport? Was it possibly one of the other um, right. shooters? Then there was one press helicopter circling the island while all of this was happening. That was the only helicopter there, and none of the official ones ever arrived. They landed on the, an island a few kilometers away. That, that's where they landed. They never came close. But they took some photos, and in, in one of the film sequences, they managed to get uh, just a little glimpse of, of the guy walking around shooting. Now, the guy shooting there was a southpaw, he was left-handed, ah. and the guy that is arrested and, and uh, sentenced for this whole is right-handed. The guy that was shooting had a ball, ball patch. The guy that is sentenced does not. The uniform he has on has uh, reflex uh, stripes of the reflexes uh, in different positions than the one that he was arrested in. And the one that is put forward as evidence is not the same as the guy even that it was filmed. Now, when he was arrested, he was in a wetsuit, uh, like a d uh, dark blue wetsuit with an emblem uh, on the left uh, shoulder where it says uh, police. But the guy that, that the, uh, the SWAT team thought, took photos of, his uh, wetsuit, it's a similar one, but that is dark blue. The, the one Breivik has on is gray, dark gray. And the facial structure, even though they look similar, I would say it's not the same person. He's much more heavy set and so on. And on the chest here, uh, the uh, Anders Breivik, when he was arrested, he has, a, there's a, like a big logo, printed logo, but the one, the man arrested has not got that logo on his wetsuit. Do you see, we are talking major problems here. Right. Yeah, two different at least. And then surrounding this whole thing are uh, the, quite a few of the key people around this whole thing are high up Freemasons. And the <laughs> Grand Master of Nor Norway was in Oslo when the bomb blew, and then he was he took off and he drove more or less parallel with the the assassin. They say he, because he arrived more or less at the same time at his holiday house with a perfect view of the island, so he could hear and see these youngsters being killed and shot and so on. Wow! Now, now, of course, this was just bad luck, and so of course. I mean, no. Yeah. Around these things, sometimes there's a very dark, uh, ritualistic uh, thing that I've seen repeated again and again when it comes to date, when it comes to the number of death, uh, when it comes to the way they kill them and, and so on. And uh, the number of dead was for three or four, at least several days after this thing, was 84 from the island, 84 dead. But then in the end, it turned out that it was 68. They miscalculated, I'm sorry, and we just made a, a mistake. So they changed it, they, they, you know, 16 bodies more or less, sorry about that. But it took two days. And in the autopsy report, there were two families that were, that were given the, the bodies of their dead child that, and said that, it was a, that they drowned. But then when the parents saw the body, there were big bullet holes in them. And then they said, oh, I'm sorry, we made a mistake. I'm, I'm, I'm sorry. Yeah. Then uh, also in the autopsy, it said it's on all the victims, it is said uh, was shot by a rifle or pistol. Pistol or rifle, several times by pistol or rifle. But in a real autopsy, you always have 
the caliber of the, yeah. the weapon, whatever, that, that is not mentioned at all. And it, the reason I would suggest is that the, the ammo that was used here was mainly uh, from the, it was a manufacturer called Silver Tip, and it's a very, very special ammo that is only used by special ops in the CIA and Mossad. Thank you very much. And it's a, an ammo that explodes. It, it's not hollow point. This one more or less pulverizes inside the body and makes immense damage to oh, yeah. the body that is hit. Then you have the problem with the amount of shots being fired. He, he wouldn't even have been able to carry that amount of ammo around on his own. You know, but there on the photos, there's no, uh, you know, it's not that he's got big belts of ammo yes. around his neck or anything like nothing like that. And he, would, I don't think he would be able to to carry it anyway. But uh, that nobody really has uh, looked into. Also, all of these kids that had mobile phones, was there not one of them that filmed this thing? Was there not one of them that took a photo? Was there not no no no, none of them did. They just tried to call home, and that's it. Wow. It is. Uh, and uh, can I just tell you, uh, just a finishing off thing, so that uh, to say what happened when I was there. Okay. Yes. Yeah. Great. I was. I, th I think I delivered quite a lot within an hour, so I will let your brain rest. Oh, well, just try to take in what I just wow, said because yeah. it is absolutely, it is unreal that no one has looked into it. I know of no one except for a handful of, I mean, we're just so few. So I really think this needs to go out so big time. But anyway, we, uh, I was lucky enough to be uh, escorted and guided by this uh, Norwegian journalist, Hans Gordon, uh -huh. because he is the expert on this. So we went out to the island. Uh, he, he had never been there. And uh, anyway, we, um, we um, uh, went to this camping site uh, and there was a little shop there. And we wanted to ask about the ferry it was, uh, because this, this was the day before the memorial. And so we went in there. They had uh, Boats for rent and kills for rent and and so on. We're selling postcards and there was a little cafeteria. So we asked the young lady in the reception about the ferry, and and she she reacted a little bit odd. I thought she she was like taken back by it. and she said, uh, uh, I don't think it goes today. Um, I don't think it's in traffic. So we said, okay. Um, so do you think maybe we can rent a boat uh, and because we want to go across? And she said, I'm, I'm sorry, but uh, the man who's got the license is not here. Okay, license, for, I don't know, it was so difficult to boat 600 meters. Right. So I said, uh, uh, well, can we rent a canoe or two? Because we were four, there were two of my new friends from Norway, the journalist and myself. And she said, yes, when? I said, well, now would be the time. And so she said, oh, okay. So I started filling in a paper where I wrote my name and, and these things. And while I was doing that, one of my friends went to the bathroom and when he came back, he saw, noticed that there was another girl working in the, uh, doing the dishes or whatever. So he started talking to her and she was very open and said, no, no, the fairy is working uh, just like normal and, uh, and so on. So she, she answered a lot of questions. So when I heard that, I thought, great, let's take That's the fairy. Cool. So I said to the girl in the reception, please uh, keep the paper uh, for, for the contract and uh, we'll go if the ferry doesn't work, we'll come back, we rent the canoe and we go. Fine. So the thing was, uh, this uh, friend of mine, the, the journalist, he had not had lunch that day and he had brought a big bowl of pasta, you know, with the plastic still right. there. He, he hadn't shaven with a cap and thick glasses and, you know, very laid back guy. Anyway, so we went down to the ferry, uh, where the ferry uh, was located. It's a very small little place, very small little ferry, I mean, and there was absolutely no people, but there was quite a few vehicle, uh, officially looking vehicles on the parking. So I, I just stand and took photos of them, you know, you never know. Right. There was ambulance, police, uh, there were some other ones that I didn't recognize and, and so on. So 
and uh, no people at all. Then this infamous ferry was there, MS Tulga, but with a, uh, a, a cable, uh, you know, so it, it wasn't in traffic. And next to it, there was a brown boat. It looked like one of these tourist boats you see in, in Paris or Amsterdam and so on. You know, these beautiful right. wooden Long. boats that, uh, yeah, wide ones that, uh, um, so that was next to it. And then there was a small, what looked like a little small party tent with two uh, Red Cross uh, people in Red Cross uniforms. They were sitting there. So it was the four of us and these two people. I saw. I noticed that there were some people in this uh, brown uh, tourist type of looking boat as well, but I didn't really notice them. Anyway, so we went over to the Red Cross people and asked, uh, "When is the next boat?" And they said, uh, "Well, uh, the last one to come back is quarter past six. And I said, "But I'm here on the mainland. I would like to go there. So when is the next?" And then they answered sort of a bit cryptic, well, it comes and goes all the time. And the thing was, I didn't really understand because there was only one ferry, so which boat were I talking about? Right. You know, the ferry. So anyway, I didn't really think of that, any more of that. So we, I, I got the, my friends to take some photos of me with the ferry and so maybe I could use for interviews or articles and so on. And then I said, uh, oh, we were standing there and we agreed, well, we'll just wait and see when the boat comes will go across because I just want to go on location to go get the emotional right, you can connection feel. with it, the feel for it, you know, right. the angles, the distances that it's so, so helpful when you look at these things, when you're on site. And uh, so we were standing there waiting. And then after maybe 10, 15 minutes, suddenly three people came out of this uh, brown wooden boat uh, in wetsuits, young, young people wetsuits and headsets and they just ran across the bridge jumped into like a a power boat a power rubber boat i think with double engines and and so on and do you know these one of these things uh, i don't know what they call syntax or phantom or something like that and just took off full speed towards the island so i thought excellent so i started filming it just so that i could time how long would it take right. if somebody really wanted to get across it took more or less exactly one minute. Wow. That would have, that would have been the time to rescue these poor, Kids. poor victims. Yeah. yeah. So anyway, we thought that there was some kind of emergency, you know. So while it was there, there were other people coming out from this um, uh, brown boat. There were two uh, elder gentlemen in naval uniforms, uh, blue uniforms with gold things. Uh, on. There were some people from the Red Cross and, and so on. So. We, there was also a similar tent, like the red one, Red Cross one, on the island, we could see that. So I thought, okay, it's for the anniversary or the memorial tomorrow or something like that. Right. But the, the rubber boat went out there, after maybe 30, minutes, 30 seconds, it turned around and it came full speed back, you know, full, so I just kept filming. And uh, uh, when it came ashore, two police officers jumped out and, and came running. So I said to the other ones, we're getting visitors. But they, they thought I was kidding because they thought, no, they're just gonna, somebody has, something has happened, you know, it's right. an emergency, they're gonna jump in the car and take off. Nope, they came, ran and stood right in front of us. And very ah. strict, uh, very military looking, there was one man, one woman, and the man, very fit, you know this, you, when you see a military, well-trained guy, you know, the balance, uh, the eye, the way they look, special type of people. And uh, in his early 30s, something like that, tall, muscular. Anyway, he stood in front of us and he said, uh, please, um, what are you doing here? Can I see some ID? And showing ID is something I do not like to do because right. that, in my world, is the first sign of a police state. when. Right. Innocent citizens have to show the ID just because somebody in the uniform asked them, I do not like. Anyway, so my beautiful friend, the, the Norwegian guy, uh, still was standing there eating the, out of the pasta bowl. Uh, he said, but why? Why do we have to show ID? I mean, we're just standing here right. as a public place. So why? And the police said, listen, I'm not into games. Just show me ID. And he said, but 
are we suspected or anything? Do you, do you think we're terrorists or what? Right. And then the, the police officer just said, you and I over there. So he, he walked away with, with him to the side, took him to the side and told his colleague, the woman, uh, the female police officer, check these three. So she started asking for our ID. Uh, um, I had my passport in my pocket, but I said, I'm not going to show that one. So, but I didn't want to put my the two other people because they had absolutely nothing to do with this. I didn't want to put them in any bad situation right. either. They showed their ID, and I showed like a, a, a Spanish insurance card with my name on it. I right. mean, it was not a state secret that I was in 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 uh, Norway. I mean, I gave a talk the day before called "False Flag Operate uh, Political Assassinations and False Flag Operations." They knew and who after you that, were. I was in. They I knew was you. Uh, informed up. Sorry. They know who you are. But anyway, they, uh, I was informed afterwards that one in the audience was from the PST, the secret the police in, in Norway. But the thing, I welcome them as well, because they, if anyone needs to know what's going on, you know, so they're more than welcome. Anyway, so uh, we gave them our names, and then the officer came back. He went on the, his uh, radio, blah, 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 took a minute. Then he came back, stood right in front of me and said, all are down the board. Uh, a decision has been taken uh, in some police district. I do not know where it was. Uh, he said, Norwegian and Danish police has nothing on you, but uh, a decision has been taken. You're not welcome here. You're not welcome here today or tomorrow. You are allowed to leave on, on your own or you will be arrested. So I looked into his eyes. I mean, sometimes I get scared, but this time not. Um, I looked into his eyes to see, you know, who, who are you? What are you protecting? So I said to him, uh, okay, at the same time, can I suggest that you, since you're protecting what I believe to be a very, very ugly incident, that you inform yourself what it is you're protecting against people like myself. It was like speaking to a, oh, a yeah. wall, you know, it's yeah. like it wasn't even worth it. So anyway, uh, he said, well, uh, we are aware that you, you uh, give talks about uh, cons uh, assassinations and that you have a theory that they're connected and so on. These, everybody is uh, entitled to an opinion, but not here and now. So please leave or we will escort you. So my friend with a, still with a pasta bowl, <laughs> he, was, he was so cool, I tell you. I was just like, yay, uh, totally not, not shaken or stirred. Uh, you know, so he, uh, he said, but what's your name? You know, we told you ours, what's your name? And the police said, I'm not giving you that. So do you mind if we take a photo of the two of us together? He said, and he was almost like to take a selfie of, of the two. Right. And the guy just backed off and said, absolutely not. The only thing I can give you is my service number, Delta 031. Delta 031. So since the Delta teams were so essential in this whole operation, I believe that I might have been standing, looking right into the eyes of somebody who was part of the whole operation. I bet. Because the teams that, the teams that were involved were Delta 04, Delta 05, and so on, and Delta 031, I would say it could very well be Del Delta 03, and he was Delta 31, you know. Yeah. And that, that would make, it would be logical as well that he would be part of the stopping anyone from getting too close if he had been part of it, you know, since everything is compartmentalized and kept into a small unit as possible and so on. So interesting experience. And then uh, we left. We, we didn't leave the area. Uh, I mean, they thought we did, but instead we went back to the camping. This is the thing I love with these people. They, they're so used to scare the living bejesus out of people that they think they will obey, obey just because of that. But we just took off and then took a left instead of a right and went back to the camping. And uh, this poor girl that was with us, uh, you know, there was a girl and it was the first time she was shaking. She was going to take a photo. I, I saw the whole of her was just, she was so intimidated uh, by the, yeah, poor girl. And also the other guy, that he was not prepared at all. He's lived, both of them on a week, and I think this was a real shocker for them to experience a thing like this. But then 
uh, I went down to the water, there's this, um, you know, for me, these things are really emotional. Because when you, when you feel the pain of the families and the victims and all, just being part of these so-called politics, these big chess games with no consideration for, for normal people whatsoever, the more best, the better for them to get the emotional thing going and so on. It's awful. So I, I went down to the water and I was sitting there, you know, it was this exact same time of day, uh, you know, the, the time, the sun was, uh, the water, the temperature in the water was the same, the beautiful surroundings. I mean, it was, I could almost hear the shooting and the screaming and the, yeah. the pain and the terror mixed with this immense beauty of the area. And there's a beautiful, beautiful little statue there with a, a man uh, holding a woman, uh, you know, comforting her. And, uh, oh, Paul, it's just, we need to stop yeah. this. We really need to stop it. It's, it's enough. It's enough. It's enough. I have questions. Maybe. I have questions. Go, go. I have five more minutes. I okay, five more minutes. Okay, go ahead. No, no go I ahead. I, I wanted to know, do you think it was a ritual sacrifice or do you think it was because of political motivation, some, some kind of political motivation? I would say yes to both of them. Uh, there's a very definite... Uh, uh, the, there's an involvement by Bilderberg surrounding this, as with so many others. Uh, the former uh, Norwegian Prime Minister, Gro Harlem Brundtland, who was also one of the architects behind Agenda 21, together with Moira Strong. She was there on the island the whole morning until about uh, an hour before the sh shooting started. Then the, the whole, the man, Jens Stoltenberg, uh, the Prime Minister at that time, he, as a Bilderberg as well, as well as his father, Thorvald Stoltenberg, and he was the one that uh, surrounded and united the whole nation after this. Before this, uh, Norway was about to leave in protest against the, the bombings of, of Libya and Afghanistan. Uh. Uh, but now, they went, they got straight back into to the line, you know, and there was rumors saying that if Norway had left, then Denmark would have as well, and that would have made major problems. So I think what we're seeing is, you know, when Obama says sometimes we need to twist the arms of some nations, right. I think this was a twist of the arm. But the, the guy who left the island with a ferry, his name is Eskil Pedersen, uh -huh. and he said to be the illegitimate son of Jan Stoltenberg. So three key people surrounding this whole thing, including uh, some other Bilderbergers and Freemasons around this whole operation, is very, very key in, in the whole thing. And I would say that she went over to the island and spent time with this. It's, it's a, a really bizarre, very, very dark thing, I would say. Because I, I truly believe she was aware of this, and they were they were all in on it. And then after that, um, Norway was named honorary member of NATO, okay. and then Stoltenberg after after he uh, left as a prime minister, he was elected the uh, uh, new chief of NATO. And his task or his vision of NATO is to dissemble it, has always been. But I would say this is the New World Order agenda that they want a world army. So they need to, to uh, de decompose type of thing, deconstruct the United Nations forces and the NATO and unite them into one world army. That is their idea. And this is what we see happening here. So high time to wake up, scary times if we don't, I tell you. It really is, it really is. Uh, before you go, I want to make sure that everybody knows your website and the fact that you do this on your own with no public funding. You do this just because of the generosity of people uh, like us and uh, like other people that you run into. Uh, so, so give them your website and make sure we can, everybody can get in touch with you while we... My website is lightonconspiracies.com lightonconspiracies.com 
a very handpick name because this is what I try to do, to go into the darkest of the darkest corner, into the belly of the beast, but with the intention of love and compassion, forgiveness, spread the light, heal it. And I would, I would very much like to ask for support uh, an exchange of energy, just like you say, I am no funding, I'm not employed by anyone. I spent 30 years doing this for no gain on myself. I just want to make a beautiful world, be part of that for all of us. And also for people who are hanging on to their money, uh, please understand that if the dark force, if their agenda goes through, and it is within the next few months we're looking at, your money will become worthless. So why not invest in, in people like Paul and Mindy, myself, other researchers who are doing this because we are on our knees, most of us, financially. Why not invest in your own future by pumping in funds to people like myself so that we can, we're so willing to do it. I'm so willing to do whatever it takes, but I'm like a car without fuel. Get me out there. Just like this beautiful man in, in Holland uh, got me the ticket to Norway. That has helped. I'm doing loads of interviews around this thing, spreading light on this very infected uh, trauma uh, just by that. I'm not talking about big sums. I'm just talking about help, help me do what I'm supposed to do. Help me do my dharma. And uh, I've got newsletters. I've got books. Uh, donation buttons, whatever, it's so appreciated. So please, please, or if you don't respect me, find whoever you respect, give them your support, because we need to move forward now. We need to get keep this ball rolling. I think we're really moving it forward now. They're, they're backing, it's falling apart around them, but we need to continue because they will try more and more in more and more violent uh, ways to to stop it and i think especially they're aiming around september 15 with the end of jade helm and and other things that is where they're trying to get the crescendo going and just hammer us so we need to before then do it we need to stand together now Thank you very much, yep. Oli. This has been a great interview. I'm so amazed at what you were able to come up with <laughs> and making connections with bikers and everybody else who has been, we've all been taken advantage of by this. Thank you very much. This Thank is you. The thing. Yeah. This is the thing. We've been played. We have been played out against each other. Races, religions, bikers, uh, immigrants, uh, rich man, poor man. They, they've been playing us. And it's time for us to say, listen, guys, we're not up for it. We see what's going on. We can see who's pulling the strings, and we're not doing it anymore. Exactly. The beautiful word to use is no. No when it comes to their game, and yes to love, compassion, forgiveness. Yes to your brother, your neighbor, anyone who needs help. Do good, be good, spread good. You know, kindness is awesome. They have made it, it turn into some meeky, weak term. I tell you, look at Jesus. Not that I'm religious, but he was a, he was a rebel, and, and they killed him for it right. because of kindness. Look at Gandhi. They killed him. Look at Martin Luther King. They killed him because of the size of their heart. But the time is now ripe for, for this thing to happen. Exactly. So, hallelujah, baby. Hallelujah. Thank you very much, Oli. Uh, I'm glad that you could spend some time with us today and uh, uh, keep doing your great work and uh, we'll keep in touch with you and maybe we can do another as you get further and further into this. It looks like a ritual sacrifice to me to keep people in the, in the, um, in the EU. Uh, yeah. Thank you very much. My absolute pleasure, Paul. Always here when you need me, if okay. you need me. God bless you. Talk to you later. Stay cool. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Wow. What an amazing guy. I hope you do consider uh, contributing to his website because he's out there ready to go anywhere. I remember uh, about a year ago, he wanted to go down to uh, Sierra Leone and investigate the, uh, the Ebola case. And everybody was frightened of Ebola. Not only. 
He was ready to get in the plane and go. He just wanted a ticket. Anyway, I was really inspired by the interview because um, of all the things that he was able to find out about this false flag in kind of a corner of the world where, the, you know, not a lot of people, especially English-speaking people, think about. I was also inspired by him talking about the biker gangs and, and other uh, groups that are being exploited by these same powers that be to play into their global domination agenda. We're all victims by this. We're all victimized. We're all used if it's our religion using us, if it's our government using us, if it's our employer using us. We're all being victimized. And we have to realize that the only way it's going to stop is when we stop cooperating, when we stop playing around, playing along. We have to really stand up and we have to take our, our freedom back. And I hope that this uh, bit of investigative reporting by Oli has inspired you as much as it inspired me to really, you know, let's wake up, let's wake up everybody, and let's stop cooperating with this horrible agenda. Well, that's all we have for World Beyond Belief this week. Thank you very much for watching. God bless you, and be nice to one another. Bye-bye.